And welcome to another episode of the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on the Staples Network, the show that provides research and statistics all about the Detroit and Michigan sports teams, whether fans like it or not, and detects, exposes, and reveals actual and hidden facts and truth that the mainstream media doesn't want you to know, if there are any. I'm Taylor Phillips. Follow me on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at DT2Phillips with two L's. Follow Frank Vazner, my co-host here with me tonight, at on Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at Frank underscore Vazner, V-A-J-C-N-E-R. Follow the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast on Twitter, Periscope, on Instagram at Michigan underscore truth. Also like its verified Facebook page, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast. Check out its website, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast.com. And scour the Stables Network's new website, Primetime with the Stables Network.com. Also, subscribe to its uh, to the Stables Network's YouTube channel, The Stables Network. The disclaimer reads: The Michigan Sports Truth Podcast does not represent or defame any of the teams it covers, nor does it represent any or compete against any of the mainstream media in the state of Michigan. It only detects, exposes, reveals actual and hidden facts and truth and statistics about them because the truth is out there. So lots to talk about. A few uh, stories, including uh, the Quandre Diggs trade that's pretty much nobody's nobody in the Lions fan base is happy about. And we understand that. That's a no-brainer. Also, uh, the Pistons uh, starting their regular season, waving Joe Johnson, the Red Wings, waving Jonathan Erickson and uh, continuing their losing streak. They're down 4-2 to two in the Ottawa Senators and Canadian Tire Center right now. And um, uh, there was also another uh, injury, up, injury update on uh, MSU basketball. But first off, um, yeah, we're going to talk about college football and the Lions too later on. We're going to switch things up a bit. Let's start off with the Pistons. They uh, released, uh, they waived Joe Johnson, veteran forward. Uh, Joe Johnson probably is going to retire. And then, the, then we hear Blake Griffin is going to be out the, at least the first five games. Going to be out until like the beginning of November with knee hamstring issues. And then we heard, we hear tonight that they beat the Indiana Pacers, um, 119 to 110 without Blake Griffin. Andre Drummond, 32 points, 23 assists, all that stuff. Luke Kennard off the bench, 30 whopping points. 30 whopping points for Luke Kennard. Yikes. Luke Kennard is actually becoming more almost elite, if not elite. 30 points for Luke Kennard off the bench. Yikes. Well, he also had six and nine from the long line. Oh boy! Yeah, he's not, yeah, he's that, knocking down and, his shots. Yeah, Luke Kennard's a heck of a three-point shooter. He is. I've known that for like at least two years now. Luke Kennard can sink threes. Not not quite as good. As, still not as quite as still not quite as good as Donovan Mitchell, but still, Luke Kennard can can really score points, especially from the from the three-point line. Six of the most of those six three bombs that Kennard hit were very, very key. There were a couple of them that put the Pistons in the lead multiple times. So, yeah, that that's been that's been the positive story. The Pistons, the one con they need to work on is uh, turn is limiting the turnovers. They in that win, nineteen one nineteen to one ten. That's. Um, Luke, yeah, the, the Pistons, uh, lots of traveling calls, offensive, offensive foul calls, um, just or just throwing the ball away out of bounds, or just giving it away to the opposing player, like oh, like around twenty of them. That that's what they needed. Yeah, they had eighteen turn They had eighteen turnovers tonight. Yeah, that's pretty close. Eighteen. Yep. Yep. Uh huh. So. Yeah, that's another thing they need to work on. But yeah, they they had just plenty of offense. Uh, they they played a little defense as well. Uh, it was a it was a very high scoring game. Um, there's there's uh, not a lot lot of uh, keep in mind a lot of uh, NBA game regular season games are uh, 
high scoring affairs nowadays, even the postseason. It, it's all just heating up. Um, it, it it's just um, very. Um, it, it was just it's just very amazing how uh, NBA uh, how uh, point scoring has skyrocketed in the NBA. But the Pistons found a way to beat the Indiana Pacers on the road at Bankers Life Fieldhouse. It's it it's just uh, and without Blake Griffin. That's crazy, because with all that depth from those other guys, Tony Snell, Markeith Morris, Bruce Bruce Brown with a key rebound. Um, let's see here. We got Christian Wood being the backup center. Thon Maker stepping up. Of course, Andre Drummond it, it, uh, led the way with 32 points, 23 rebounds. An another uh, season opener where Andre Drummond has uh, posted at least a 20, 20 at least 2020 game. That's, that's amazing. And, that's, and Taylor also gotta get, gotta realize that uh, Derek Rose, his first game as a piston, he chipped in 18 points off the bench too. Oh 27 boy. minutes in action. So man, I wouldn't say that was a vintage D Rose, but still it was a nice contribution from him. 18 points isn't that shabby. It's, in fact, it's really good. In fact, yeah, it's good. I mean, at, at least good. Yep. Not great, but good. Pistons are home against the Atlanta Hawks Thursday. That, that's tomorrow. That's Thursday at 7 at Little Caesars Arena. That's their home opener. Griffin's definitely not going to play that in that game. But uh, the, the Hawks are really, 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 have been really, really bad the last few years. I, I think the Pistons should handle them as of right now on paper so yeah then, i'm looking to the, see if the, i'm trying to see if the hawks played tonight they did not so i think they're playing tomorrow would be their season opener as well if i'm not mistaken yes oh nice okay gotcha so um definitely so yeah that's it, uh, great that the uh, Pistons are on a one and zero start, getting a win on the road in in uh, Indiana, uh, a division right of an arch divi a division arch rival, the Indiana Pacers. The Pistons uh, making a statement early on, and that's yeah. uh, ver ver that's very good. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what they do against the Hawks. The Hawks are a fair, they're a fairly young team. I think every, everybody is pretty much 30 or under, with the exception of Vince Carter, who at 42 years young is still on the roster. But I mean, you got guys like John, they got guys like John Collins, who is a rising star. Trey Young is another rising star. You got yeah, rookies and really good rookies and Cam Reddish, uh, DeAndre Hunter, there are guys who I bet who play. I think contributed last year. Kevin Herter who played, who played his college ball at Maryland, and they've also got Chandler Parsons who has been around who's been around the league a little bit too. So it's a, I think it will be a good test for them. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. Yeah. Then they got the Philadelphia 76ers on Saturday before hitting the West Coast. Let me recheck my schedule here. They play the Philadelphia 76ers at home. Those two next uh, those next two games are at home. Also they got the Pacers uh that they they don't hit the West Coast yet. Uh they're home against the Pacers on Monday next week. Then they're in Toronto yes. against the NBA champions next Wednesday. The Toronto Raptors at 7:30. But those three home games all at seven, and then um, they're in Chicago a week from Friday at eight o'clock against the Bulls at United Center. They get, I don't think they hit the West Coast for a while until, oh, let's see here, uh, like early January, early or late December to early January. They got on December twenty yeah. eighth. They're in San Antonio. Uh, December thirtieth at Utah. January 2nd at the Clippers, 
January 4th on Saturday at, at the Warriors at 8.30 p.m., which is an early time. Uh, and then on Sunday, January 5th at, at uh, the L.A. Lakers before they head back to Cleveland and take on the awful Cleveland Cavaliers at, at what used to be Quicken Loans Arena. What's the new... What's the new name of that arena again? If you look I, it up. I was aware that the name of it had changed. I'll have to look, look that up. Last I knew it was still the it was still quick and warm the arena. Yeah, I can I can look that up. Yeah, if I'm right, if I'm wrong on that, I apologize, but I was not aware of the name changing. Thing. And they do have another their other West Coast swing, I believe, is gonna be in late, late February into March where they go to Portland, Denver, yeah. Phoenix, and February. Sacramento. Yeah, in the March yeah. when they played March, Portland, yeah. Denver, Phoenix, and Sacramento. The Pistons should be able to handle the Sacramento Kings and the Phoenix Suns. The, the Blazers and the Nuggets, my gosh, they're tough opponents. Jeez, watch out. So, yeah. The Pistons, yeah, the, the, that's a challenge for them. It's going to be interesting to see with how much depth the Pistons have on their roster when they hit the road on the West Coast against those tough teams like the Blazers, the the uh, Nuggets, the Warriors, all those teams like the Spurs and the Jazz and the Clippers, even the Lakers with LeBron James. Uh, the Lakers had a rough year the the la uh, last regular season, uh, but I I think the Lakers will improve at least somewhat slightly, if not vastly, but still, in all seriousness, it, it, it's going to be tough for the Pistons when they hit the, uh, hit, when they uh, go out West, not once, but twice. It, yeah. it, they can't, they can't stay out West all like wait for way too long. They gotta, they gotta, they gotta like split that long, long, what would have been a long, long road trip into two short, Two decently long, decently uh, length, uh, lengthened uh, road trips on the West Coast, so that would be fair, of course. Yeah. So, Frank, I want to uh, let you uh, have your take on uh, the Pistons waving Joe Johnson. I think that was a no-brainer. Joe Johnson, uh, thirty-eight years old, he was a he was a good three-point shooter in his prime, but. I guess I, I guess things must not have worked out between him and the Pistons. So take it away. I would agree with you on that. I think they just, he just was trying to see if he could revive his NBA career here, just to see if he could get to him to sign to a low risk deal. But it didn't. It wasn't meant to be for him to, to latch out of the Pistons. So who knows what he's going to do if he's going to move on somewhere else if we're going to see him in the summertime with the big three again. And, but I, I think probably his best, his best days are behind him. So he'll probably just end up shooting around with the big three and making his bank there. Yeah. That, that's all. So that's all he was doing was just shooting threes. I get, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, he was pretty much just at, at best an isolation guy. Uh, if he was going to shoot, he was going to be a pretty heavy volume shooter. They're not pass a lot. And that really wasn't something the Pistons were going to need a lot of. So, oh well. He's moved. They moved on from him. Well, hopefully, he finds something where he's been good. But, you know, they Pistons need to get a lot younger. They don't need to have some. You don't need to have a lot of old guys around. Yeah, uh huh. But uh, throughout the entire regular season, in general, the Pistons—it's going to be a lot, a lot, in, a lot more interesting. The way I see it, the way they beat the Pacers, especially on the road without Blake Griffin. Oh man, the Pistons are going to be a stronger force to be reckoned with, from what I can tell. It, if not elite, but still stronger. They yeah, just, only t yeah. only time will tell. We'll see how they. I mean, but we do. I will ask everyone to. When I look at the uh, score, their box score against the Pacers. 
There's a, you have to remember that the Pacers were without Victor Oladipo tonight. He didn't play. Oh. Yeah, so I mean, I, I looked at their starters. Demontis Sabonis led them with 27. Miles Turner had 25. Malcolm Brogdon 22, and they got Teddy from Jeremy Lamb and T.J. Warren, but not much else. I mean, their bench only had, I believe it was 16 points, and that was six from Doug, Mc, ah, Doug McDermott, excuse me, six from. Edwin Sumner and four from TJ McConnell. They weren't getting, they didn't get a lot. They didn't really get anything off their bench. Yeah. So, and, uh, yeah, we got, we got a scoring update. The uh, Ottawa Senators just uh, iced their game by, uh, with an empty net goal from uh, one of their players. It's now five to two with 148 left in the third period. Duclair on the goal. Probably, oh, probably an empty header. The Red Wings. Uh, uh, yes, the set, you are correct. Anthony Duclair from Nemesta, Nemestikov at 18 yeah, 12, what? empty net. Yeah. My goodness. The Senators were coming in, going in 1 6 and 1, going, home, uh, going into their home game against the Wings. Uh, now the Wings have lost, oh man, uh, five, six straight. Probably five or so, up at least. Uh, they they lost in the Maple Leafs before they got swept in Western Canada. So that's six games. My gosh. Let's well, see. They lost. Uh, yeah, this will be six straight games now. Yeah. Oh, uh, and, and and five of them have given up five goals. Oh gosh. That, 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 how? Yeah. Not only is the defense bad, but. Howard and Bernier, gosh, their goaltending has been a problem too. I mean, really, they got to they they got to do something with the goaltending department. Steve Eisenman has got to has got to release Jimmy Howard early and uh, and uh, eat eat up Jimmy Howard's money on that two year contract extension that Ken Holland signed him to. Well, hold when he on, was the GM. Like Taylor. Howard's contract actually expires at the end of this season. So Oh, I'm sorry. That's that's Jeff Lashels. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Yeah, thank yeah. Yeah, thank God that that's gone. Jimmy Coward. But yeah, Jonathan Bernier was in net tonight, but even he didn't help. That's like that's definitely not the first time that Jonathan Bernier has given up four plus goals. Yeah, he did again. Yeah, that was uh yeah, I guess Vancouver, he he got shelled pretty hard. Five to one. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, uh-huh. I mean, now that I mean, they're gonna come. They're gonna come home and face an improved Buffalo team next. And then you got the Blues, come, the defending Stanley Cup champion, St. Louis Blues, coming in. Edmonton, who's really been a lot better for the start. I think if they get. I'm not really sure where they could possibly steal one, at, uh, one but truthfully, I think uh, uh, I'm just starting to wonder how long it's going to be before Eisenman decides to shake the tree. You know, whether that means he sends somebody else packing. Or Such as knows. Trevor Daly, uh, Mike Green. Mike Green's been a disease on the ice. Took too many yeah. penalties in that one game in Vancouver in, in the 5-1 loss. Then in then in uh, Calgary on Thursday he he continued to be awful. That's an another five one loss. And, and Green just keeps taking penalty after penalty after penalty. Um, yeah. He got a goal in Edmonton, but th- that's that that's definitely not going to cut it. So uh, that, Mike Green is definitely definitely gone after this year. Yeah. I mean, and obviously, hopefully. yeah, Green will be gone as a free agent. Trevor Daly's a free agent. I think they're both gone. Gone in there. I'm not sure who would be gone before. There's a lot of fours that still have time, have a lot of term left. Uh, so we'll see what happens there. I mean, Jonathan Erickson, who got waived and he ended up clearing, I think he's probably, he's not going to be brought back. I'm, I've heard speculation that he may just up and decide to call it quits. 
So that's another contract that's gone. <laughs> Who's that again? Jonathan Erickson, who got yeah, waived. Yeah, Erickson. Yeah, waived. And, yeah, he cleared waivers and, and got assigned to the Grand Rapids Griffins in the AHL. But, yeah, yeah Erickson's was, probably going to retire. Well, there was a report from Elliot Friedman that I believe he said it in his 31 Thoughts podcast that they did, that Eisenman did try to trade Erickson. I guess he couldn't get anyone to fight, but, oh, well. Well, I didn't think there was really any room at the end for anyone, especially since Erickson's not that productive of a player. And so he decided to cut him loose. Yep. He gone. Uh-huh. Also, you got uh, Mass and Bowie. Uh, pro- probably probably only here for this year. Well, he is a, he is a restricted free agent, so it's going to depend if Eisenman wants to tender him a qualifying offer or not. Yeah, I I guess. Um, yeah, Luke Lindenny isn't has has not been doing too shabby uh, at least with the puck. I, I know he hasn't produced, but um, uh, he scored one empty net goal. But he, he's he hasn't produced much. But man, can he uh, do really good on the penalty kill? I think the Wings still need him. Oh well, yeah, he has. Lo- I mean, I, I mean, look, I've I've been somebody who was real who said that. <laughs> excuse me, Glenn Denning was didn't need to be around, but I mean, he's. He, I mean, I'll give him credit where it's due. He's busted his rear end. He's gotten better. He's realized he's got a he's found a bitch on the team. He goes out there, and does his job, does what's asked of him. I mean, the one point eight billion is a little much, but that's only for two more years, and I think. I don't think it'll be this season, but probably next season. If he, can, he keeps looking better, then it's a possibility that he could be a trade ship. Yeah, that, that's uh, – pr- yeah, he could uh, be a really good trade value there too. Um, yeah, like you pointed out. So I'd probably just flip with somebody looking for help on the penalty kill come playoff time or possibly just looking for a depth forward. Uh-huh. I mean, you probably, yep. you, you're not going to get. Too, I mean, you're not going to get too much in return, but at least I think you can probably get something for them. Yeah, such as uh, like a couple draft picks or something like that. I'm, yeah, I'm I thought, a, just a wild guess. Yeah, at least a, at least a, at least a mid rounder is what I speculate. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's uh, that's better. I think that's better than letting them walk for nothing. Yeah. Uh huh. Speaking of Jonathan Bernie, back to him for a second. Uh, he he uh, he's got a three year contract right now. He's in the second yeah. of his of his three year contract. And uh, uh, yes. yeah, Bernie. Uh, although he had a couple rough games, including tonight, um, he has statistically outplayed Jimmy Howard. And I'll give Jonathan Bernie the benefit of the doubt. I think because I think Jonathan Bernier should be the starting goaltender. And then after this season, Jimmy Howard should get the heave hole. We've had enough of Jimmy think, Howard. I think he's going to get moved at the deadline. He, yeah, he might be, Jimmy Coward. Yep. Yeah, I think he'll get moved somebody looking for a goaltending help. And then I think yep. they probably bring up either Calvin Pickard or Malik yep. Larson. Yeah, that's, that's about the only alternative they would have. So, yeah. So uh, the Red Wings um, go go back. Um, let, I, I think the Wings go back home, don't they? Let me. I'm digging up the NHL app right now. Yes. Uh, they're, they're yes, all, you are, home against the you Buffalo State. Were, yes, on Friday night. Friday night. Yep. Uh, against the Buffalo Sabers, then then on Sunday at five against the Saint, the defending Stanley Cup champion St. Louis Blues. Yeah, we've we've already celebrated the uh, uh, the fact that the St. St. Louis Blues won their first ever Stanley Cup in franchise history. That's gonna that's gonna be an interesting matchup. And then then on Tuesday against the Edmonton Oilers before they go down south to southeast to Florida, or or the or southeast of the border and play the Carolina Hurricanes and the Florida Panthers. Uh, they don't, but they, except they don't play the Tampa Bay Lightning in uh, St. Pete times forum or should, or should I say, um, or Amelie Amelie Arena. Arena. Amelie yeah. Arena. 
Yeah, that, yeah I'm thinking had, of the old arena names. I'm sorry. Oh, uh, well, yeah, that's all good. They actually would not. They actually don't play the Lightning until December 29th. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, December 29th. Yep, at seven o'clock on a, that's on a Sunday night. Can't wait for it. It'll be a while before before then, but I can't wait. Hmm. Yeah, if, for the rest of the schedule, you can. Uh, Download the NHL.com mobile app or look up NHL.com or DetroitRedWings.com, any any website that has the Red Wings schedule, but especially those. So, um, the Lions, they lost to the Minnesota Vikings 42-30. to 30. Uh, The first half was a doozy, a bit of a slugfest. The Lions managed to score uh, a touchdown in the dying seconds of the second quarter to tie it up before the half, uh, before halftime, Marvin Jones with four touchdowns, Matthew Stafford, the quickest quarterback in NFL history, the quickest, not the first. Uh, I uh, like, like the 20 something is um, quarterback to, um, get to, uh, to reach 40,000 passing yards. But still, the Lions find a way to lose, and now they're two and two, three and one, still in last place in the NFC Nuke North, or 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 the NFC, or just the NFC North. Uh, the Bear, the Bears, thankfully lost. They're three and three. The Vikings are four and two with that win. The Packers are six and one uh, by beating the Raiders. The <laughs> Uh, at home at Lambeau Field. So, yeah, uh, but but those Lions, uh, they uh, their defense was nowhere, absolutely nowhere, in that in the entire game where the offense in, at, uh, lit it up in the first half, and then they disappeared in the second half. That's, but that's but that's just so Lions esque. I mean, they the Lions offense looked to be on a roll, but then they tailed off. It's it's just very baffling. They they sell for just one field goal and one Marvin Jones touchdown, which was his fourth on the year. I I get that, but still they find a way to lose. That's that's just the Lions. Thankfully, no referee controversy this time. I don't I don't have. Of course, uh, Lions fans still complain about what happened the week before. That's why one referee, for example, had to put a referee. Uh, one fan, Lions fan, you. Uh, had to uh, put on a referee uniform. My God, uh, what, what? Those are a bunch of clowns at Ford Field. They are. There are. No, literally, they were dressed as clowns. Yeah, they they, they always dress up as clowns. Every time they every time they uh, complain about the officiating, they dress up as clowns. Taylor, those are people that have too much time on their hands. Yeah, they can bite us. They can bite us. Definitely. They 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 need to grow up, go back to school, just be re-educated on, on what the game, uh, how the game is called and played down the middle. Every every fan, every fan of every team complains about the officiating. It's not just the Lions. It doesn't matter how many times. Uh, a, a particular team gets screwed over the past few years, especially all teams get screwed. That's it. Take the New Orleans Saints. Take, take, um, I don't know, whoever. But anyway, Lions have the uh, New York Giants Sunday at one on Fox. The Giants uh, lost their last game. Uh, they, they were on a roll before with their new quarterback, Daniel Jones, their uh, top draft pick. That was number six, wasn't it? Daniel Jones. Uh, yeah. It, yeah. A very unsung hero in their, the Giants' first win. Got to hand it to him. Yeah. My fa- yep. The thing is, this, this, you know, they did get a couple. Is this is still a pretty bad Giants team we're dealing with right here. Uh huh. Absolutely. Yeah, um, I mean, I, I think I want to say I don't know. It's, 
Has Saquon Barkley returned yet? I don't know. Um, uh, he he's listed as questionable on the depth chart or on the injury yep. report. Excuse me. Hey, yep. same with Sterling. Yeah. Uh, same with Sterling Shepard. Yep. Mm-hmm. There's that. Yep. Uh, the, speaking of injuries, the Lions have lost running back Kerryon Johnson. Um. Uh. Uh. uh for I don't know. Going to miss some time for probably a few weeks. He's been put on IR. He'll miss some time. He'll be reevaluated um, just sometime later. But that's a key loss for the Lions' offense. The Lions will uh, have to will have to uh, stick more to the passing game if they want to put more points on the board. Unless yeah. they can figure out the running game with the with the other running backs like Ty Johnson. And uh, McKissick, yeah, yeah, McKissick's not that good. He doesn't get first downs. Sometimes he gets some yards on some plays, but he doesn't get first downs. But um, well, they get they they apparently yeah just activated Paul Perkins. Yep, yep. Due to uh, carry on Johnson's injury, that's a veteran court, a veteran running back. Um, they uh, they. They waived him. Bef- they waived Paul Perkins before, and uh, they also um, uh, also uh, signed another running back to the uh, roster. Let's see here. Let oh, let me dig it up here. Oh. No, no, that, that's not it. Um, I think they got. Oh, they released Paul Perkins. Excuse me. They released him. And then they brought yeah, him back. They, they, yeah. And then I think they got Trey Carson off of waivers. Trey Wavers. Carson, thank you. Off waivers, yes. Gotcha. So, yeah, they, they so they didn't release Paul Perkins on uh, – uh, they put him on waivers, and then they brought him back because Paul Perkins probably cleared waivers. Trey Carson and Paul Perkins are both on the team as of right now. Yeah. So, all that's sorted out. Yes, so, they're, they're the third and fourth guys on the depth chart. Yeah, I think the Lions are going to have to uh, count on Trey Carson, for example, to get the running game going. Uh, but one thing's concerning me about the running game is the way that Daryl Bevel uh, 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 controls the, the, that running game is just Matthew Stafford handing the ball up to the running back off the middle too many times. And, that, it, and, and you know you're going to get stuffed. Uh, stop at the at the line around the line of scrimmage, and that's not going to do you any good. You got to you got to shake things up. You got to try different running plays. Uh, um, it's not. It's it probably not, uh, probably a jet sweep is not going to uh, do you any good. It's. Uh, I think it's a going to have to take like a like more pitch sweeps. On Toss that. plays. Toss plays. Yeah. Either pitch sweeps or shovel passes. Or pop passes, yeah, that that works too. Yeah, just find some holes. Yeah, the offensive line has to help the running game too. the The offensive line usually is not that good for the Lions, so um, it, it's going to come down to a very close, low scoring affair. I I still think the Lions will win. I'm going to pick. I'm going to predict 24-23 over the G-man. Frank, your predi- your score prediction. Well, I believe the spread on this game is the Lions are favored by six and a half. I do think they will <clears throat> get back to their winning ways because they, they might look pretty bad, but I think the Giants are a lot worse. So I'm going to go – I'm going to go Lions, we'll say 27-20. Okay, just by a touchdown. Yeah, it's still going to be close anyway. Yeah, it will yep. be. Yeah, it's going to be nip and tuck one way or the other. But but we both picked the Lions to beat the Giants, just to be fair. Uh, the Lions, uh, after that, they traded uh, starting safety Quandre Diggs to the Seattle Seahawks for the for a 2021 seventh-round pick and a 2020 round a 2020 fifth-round pick. And nobody's – Understandably, no one, no Lions fan on earth 
is happy about them. Neither are we. Just not just uh, just just the way it's just like the Golden Tate trade from last year. The Lions pull the self-destruct trigger on their season. It's it's why is Bob Quinn con continuing to do this every year? Oh wait, it's because the Lions. I mean, Bob Quinn can draft, but he just can't trade. That's that's uh, my analysis on the GM right now. He has a pro and a con. That's I'm 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 trying to be as fair as I can to our audience here. So, what else is there? He can he can draft, but he can't trade right. Frank, what say you? Well, I think this is another sign that they're pretty much waving the white flag. I know it was. I know it was last. I know last year everyone was saying why they trade Golden Tate away. Well, I think well it's because Golden Tate was a free was expected to be a free agent and they they didn't want to lose him for nothing. So at least they got an asset for him. And I wouldn't be surprised if maybe later they trade Marvin Jones to get a couple of draft picks after we saw uh, the 49ers end up getting Emmanuel Sanders from the Broncos in exchange for a couple of draft picks. But uh -huh. this is it. But this one still kind of baffling because earlier this year, I believe they signed Diggs to, I believe it was a three-year contract, if I'm not yep. mistaken. And then they say, oh, we're going to trade him away. Then, of course, you get pro football focus that says, oh, he wasn't that good. I mean, take that, take that for whatever it's worth. But the thing is, that this was a bad, this was a bad defense to begin with. And I don't think it's gonna, I don't think it's gonna was gonna really make much of a difference. But I mean, hopefully, you get that fifth round draft pick in. You end up drafting better. Here come draft day, and who knows? I, I don't think this is the first trade. This is the only trade that the Lions are gonna be making. And I'd say just wait and see. Yeah. Uh huh. So, yeah, the defense gave up 42 points. That's that's probably why. Uh, and Quandre, Quandre, Quandre Diggs was apparently baffled by that. I guess that's why that's why Quandre Diggs was traded to the Seattle Seahawks. Quandre Diggs yeah. is usually good, to be honest with you. That's what I've been hearing. So, yeah. Oh man. So we've covered Lions, we've covered the Red Wings, we've covered the Pistons. Uh, also, uh, Michigan State Spartans men's basketball senior, senior shooting guard Josh Langford is out indefinitely with a foot injury, and he will be reevaluated in January. That's a huge loss. Uh, the Spartans still have plenty more depth. That's what I've been hearing from the Detroit Free Press uh, on, on a newspaper that I read from my grandma, Pat Foster. Shout out goes to her. I helped her out with, uh, uh, helped her drop off a, a newspaper. Uh, then we went out, then she and I went, went out to breakfast, my grandma, Pat, Pat Foster and I. Um, it, I yeah, I'm usually not a morning person, but when, uh, when a call to action is, uh, uh, emerges, I, I answer the call. But anyway, uh, the Sp Spartans men's basketball, uh, going to be without, uh, Josh Langford for a while, and that's that's a key that's a key injury. That's a uh, that puts a dent in the uh, Spartans' non-conference season. Frank, what say you on that one? Well, I mean, I mean, I'm a Michigan State fan. I didn't, when I heard that Langford wasn't going to play, it sounded bad at first. But then I remembered that this is a team that did make it all the way to the Final Four and beat Duke without Langford in the lineup. Now I know to open to open the season and Michigan State's got a brutal and I mean brutal schedule. I'm hang on one second as I pull up their schedule. They open the season against Kentucky in the Champions class in a one versus two showdown. That's oh gonna be a tough and then they get a snoozer game that their home opener against Binghamton. That'll be a blowout. Uh, then they're at Seton Hall in a, one of the Gavit tip-off games. 
Seton Hall is expected to be pretty solid this year. Yeah, they also have uh, – they'll also play uh, in the Maui Invitational. They could end up running into Kansas there. And their first game of that in that tournament will be against Virginia Tech. And then they have, once they get back from Hawaii, they will have to play Duke at the Breslin Center of the Big Ten ACC Challenge. So, I mean, that's going to – that's not going to be easy. So, they can easily be having to play the number – the one play they're number one in the country. They're gonna have to play teams that are ranked two, possibly the third ranked team, also the team ranked number four, and also the team ranked number twelve. So but that's how that's how Tom is is. He always likes to have them play a tough schedule, play anyone, anytime, anywhere. Cause you know it's oh it's good because it'll make them better for postseason play when you're matched up against a big boy. Right, and if, if Langford does come back, which I'm not expecting him to, should I'd say best case scenario, he's probably back by the time they take their first January road trip in Big Ten play to Purdue. Who would if not? Then I think they this is going to be next man up for them. That was the case. That ended up being the case last year in the tournament. Uh huh. Yep. So um. Yeah, very, very good uh, preview of the Spartans' uh, regular season schedule. Um, that, like you pointed out, the uh, Kentucky game is going to be really tough in the Champions Classic, but uh, they got yeah. easy games in between that Shouldn't and the uh, yeah. Big Ten it is season. Worth, it is worth noting that uh, that uh, Cassius Winston and his. Uh, uh, pretty much on the watch list for the Wooden Award, and is also, I believe, he is also a consensus preseason All American. So I mean, they've got. So I don't think it's going to be too much of panic, though, especially when you've got they have one of the best players in the country, uh -huh. in Winston. So, oh, but without life, you're going to need guys like Aaron Henry, Kyle Arns, Gabe Brown. I mean, they all. I mean, Arns has been. Arns is a senior. You know, he's been – he knows what to do. Henry and Brown, I mean, they had their moments last year where, yeah, they looked bad, but then they also had moments where they looked good too. They've got a year under their belt. Well, and I think that's going to help. That's going to end up helping them. And so we'll, we'll see what ends up happening when come the season opener against Kentucky. It's definitely something I'm looking forward to. Yep, and speaking of Michigan State, the Spartans football team had their bye week last weekend. Uh, they are home against the Penn State Nittany Lions, which we'll get to with Michigan after this. Michigan State uh, is home against Penn State, number six. Uh, in East Lansing at Spartan Stadium, 330 ABC. Your preview, please. Break it all down. Well... This one, I mean, there's this one could be kind of interesting because Penn State's coming off of that high where they beat Michigan and Happy Valley in the whiteout game. But, of course, now they got to go on the road. And I'll tell you that this, Taylor, Penn State going on the road is not the same as Penn State in Happy Valley. And truthfully, I don't think James Franklin is that good of a coach. I don't like a lot of his game management. And, but this is a Penn State team that does have some pretty good talent on there. Sean Clifford, their quarterback, back has been playing pretty well. 16 touchdowns, two picks. Uh, Noah Kane has been their go-to guy running back after back now. Oh, he's solid. But also you got Michigan native K.J. Hamler, who's from Pontiac, who's their top receiver, also their most dangerous kick returner as well. I think they're going to try and get him the ball a lot. But the thing is, Penn, last time Penn State won in East Lansing, I believe, was 2009. And again, Michigan State is going in the wrong direction after getting shut out at Wisconsin. Truthfully, I think – I think this is I mean, it's a game that I think Michigan State can win because, like I said, I don't trust I don't trust James Franklin's game management. But again, I think that I don't think Michigan State's got enough to 
to keep up with the talent Penn State has. I'm actually going to say Penn State wins a 24-17 game. All right, so uh, 28-17, you say? 24. 17. 24, thank you. 24 yeah, I, think it's gonna, I, think it'll be, I think it'll be fairly close. I don't think it's going to be a I don't think it's going to be a blowout. I mean, I've I've watched Penn State a couple of times. I, mean, I saw their I saw some of their game against Iowa when they went on the road. They didn't really impress me that much. And even against even against Michigan too, I wasn't overly impressed with their performance. And the only time where I did watch them was when they played a dumpster fire team in Week One and beat them seventy nine nothing. But I'm I don't think you can take too much from that because they put they ended up playing Idaho, who isn't even a bowl subdivision team. Right. Uh huh. I don't think it's going to be a blowout either, but I'm going to predict Penn State to win 28 to 13 because Michigan State's offense still cannot get going. They were shut out at Wisconsin the last time they played a football game. That's <laughs> that, that was on the road. They're back home. I get that, but. Still, they're not going to put up uh, too many points. Uh, yeah. but I, I still don't trust their offense. Dave Warner is still on, their, still on the coaching staff. He's no longer the offensive coordinator. But the running backs coach, yeah, he, Dave Warner's got to go. The, is there, uh, the athletic director has got to do something. Yeah. Michigan State is not going to beat Penn State at all. I don't agree so, with no. that. Right. And then we got uh, Michigan at Penn State. Michigan fell behind 21 nothing at halftime. They came back to within a touchdown. Then they gave up a touchdown. Then they scored again. And then they finally had a chance in the end, uh, what looked to be a game-tying touchdown, but the receiver dropped it. That was a catchable pass. That, that was a catchable pass. You've got to catch the damn football. That, that's, that's all we ask. And you didn't do that. Michigan, as a result, lost the game 28-21. to 21. They're back down to 19th. The re-ranking from USA Today ranks Michigan 23rd, which is uh, more, more deserved. But I think 19, uh, the, AP, the real AP poll says, says it's fair, I, I guess. So, um, Frank, you want to analyze that before we get to uh, the Notre Dame game? Well, here's what here's what I will say about the, the game against Penn State. I mean, I when they fell behind twenty one on nothing, like oh my goodness, they're gonna get blown out again. But you know, they, they to their credit, they did fight back. Although we sh- we were shown that Jim Harbaugh, much like James Franklin, does not make very good in game decisions. I mean, early on, you got the ball in plus territory on fourth down. What do you do? You punt. I mean, look, you're on you're on the road. Oh, it's fourth and medium. It's definitely makeable. Why not go for it? Try and make a statement. Say, you know what? We're not scared. We're not scared of your whiteout crowd. Um, we're gonna come in here and we're gonna fight. But he said, ah, I'm just gonna punt. And then also. So oh, what is Don Brown doing? Not bracketing KJ Hamler, who is one of the best receivers in the Big Ten. He did that a lot last year. Shut him down. Now we're not going to do that this time around. And then of nope. course, and then of course, huh? The whole kicking the 58-yard field goal hole with out without using. Their distance kicker, Quinn Nordine, who's got the leg to do it. And he said, oh, he was injured. We had Moody do it. And that was – that ended up being a very bad decision. He missed horribly. Jake Moody sucks. Yeah. You don't, you don't have – you don't try out – you don't try him out to kick a 58-yarder. You just don't. I mean, why kick it? Why kick it anyway at that point? Well, unless you try, unless you try to tie the game or win it, but when you're down like 21 7, 21 nothing, whenever it happened, there's no need to do that. You can also, you can all get, go for it. And also, I mean, this, and to the fans who decided to berate Ronnie Bell, look, I'm, I'm no Michigan fan. 
but berating a receiver on social media for dropping a pass. Here's what I'm going to say to you. Have you had to make a catch in front of 110,000 opposing fans in a night game with a game on the line like that? I'll hang up and listen. I don't think so. I mean, yeah, it was the catchable ball. He dropped it. And, and I know that sucks for him. I mean, I do feel – and truthfully, I will say, yeah, he should have made that catch. However, I'm hoping that he chooses to learn from his mistake and grow from it. Guy's a human being, for Christ's sake. Don't go and threaten him, call him names, or say <sighs> he's to be taken off scholarship. Let me tell you something, what that kid probably does. He goes to class every day. He goes to practice every day. He does what the coach is asking him to do. He's respectful to everyone. You don't, it's kind of like what Mike Gundy said back in 2007 about his quarterback who got benched. And the media went haywire over it. Gundy said, you don't downgrade an amateur athlete because he made a mistake on the field. Right. You want to write some. You want to write some. Write about guys that do wrong things. Like if they go around breaking the law or doing stupid stuff, don't write about a kid who dropped a pass and does everything that he's asked to do and practice in the classroom. He's an amateur athlete. I'm an NFL player. I understand yeah. it's frustrating to watch. I mean, look. When I've seen Michigan State receivers drop passes, it's frustrating. I don't go yelling at them, telling them they need to quit playing. No. Especially when I'm in. Especially in high school games. I see a guy who misses an assignment. Then coaches tell him, might give him a chew it out for things like that. But you tell him, you know, you learn your lesson from it, move on, play the next play. Yep. Yeah. Probably. Probably should onside kick it. I don't, I don't know if I saw that or not. But um, oh wait, that was on a fourth down play. I'm sorry. So that was a turnover on downs. Yes. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. So uh, if you're Michigan's defense, uh, after that, you could have at least tried to force a fumble and try to recover that I... so you can have another chance because there's still time left. That's yeah, another. Thing. That's another thing that that covers the big. The other side, and I, believe, and I also believe that Harbaugh used one of his timeouts beforehand. I think he probably should have saved it because then he had a chance to get a stop and then maybe force the punt. And then, of course, who knows what happens? Maybe you have a shot at a Hail Mary, maybe something goes crazy with their punt, punt. maybe they have a trouble with the snap. Or maybe you get somebody like DPJ who takes it back to the hizzy. Who knows what happens? I mean, you got to, in the words of Herm Edwards, you play to win the game. Yep, absolutely. So I, mean, really that, that, I, I put that loss on the coaching staff for Michigan. Yeah. On them. But let's go back to uh, 2015 when Blake O'Neill mopped muffed the punt in Michigan, lost to Michigan State, mind you. That was four oh, years I, ago. Yeah. I was all, I was all, I mean, I, it was kind of the same deal as now. I was all over any fans who went after him, him and threatened him with death. death. No. Oh, you wow. don't do that. He's an amateur athlete. I mean, you want to yell at somebody, play this coach for not going max protect the situation. It's it was Harbaugh who put him in a bad spot. He had two guys go – I've watched that play, I don't know how many times. He had two guys split out when Michigan State had, was sending the house. There's nobody back deep. He had nobody split out wide. I had to set up for a return. He had two guys going out there covering air. So you had all 11 Michigan State guys coming up against – I think it would have been – Eight guys blocking them, so you got 11 on eight. You're not going to win that battle. Yep. Uh-huh. I see. 
So uh, Todd Faber, unfortunately, is not going to. Um, let, let's see here. Let me uh, try to uh, uh, get him in here. Uh, yeah, it's already ten fifty-five here. Uh, we don't have enough time. Preview the Notre Dame Notre Dame Michigan game. Uh, all right, uh, I will. I will say this. This I think the line the lines actually moved down to pick them. Notre Dame, I think, is definitely showing that they're still a contender for a playoff spot. I know they did lose to Georgia on the road. Oh, Ian Book playing very well at QB. He, Tony Jones Jr. has really emerged as one of their go, their go-to running back. Chase Claypool is just a beast at wide receiver, and uh, guy to watch at tight end for them is this. I think it's Kobe or Cody Kmet. But I think. Truthfully, I think Notre Dame ends up. I think no. I think this will be another classic game between Michigan and Notre Dame. I've seen. I mean, I've seen a lot of good ones. Taylor, I'm sure you've seen them too. I'll mm-hmm. say Notre Dame wins. It. I'm gonna say Notre Dame wins this one. I'll say 24-20. Uh, I beg to differ. Uh, Michigan has beaten Notre Dame at home before. They have, like, plenty of times. You are. Like, yes, you are. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the, the Irish have not – yeah, I do know the Irish have not won in Ann Arbor since 2005. Wow. Yes. When uh, Lloyd Carr and Mike Hart and Chad Henney um, – That would have – that actually would have been Charlie Weiss's first year coaching them. Definitely, yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Todd Faber has joined in. Breck Smith, you want to let him in real quickly? I'm going to go Michigan State 27 and Notre Dame 23. Yeah, you, I, I think so you Michigan want Michigan 27? Yeah, yeah, Michigan 27, okay. Notre Dame 23. I think Michigan has had Notre Dame uh, Notre Dame's number at the big house. I think I think that trend will continue. It's the home field it's just the home field advantage. Um, yeah. e- even though do, Jim yeah. Harbaugh's a dumbass. I do see I do decision. foresee this being I do foresee this being a, a very close game. I think it's going to be another classic between both schools. I mean, it's on, it's definitely when they do, when they play each other. It's must see TV. Yep. Uh huh. So, um, yeah, ten fifty seven. Uh, Todd. Um, yes, sir. Yep. Can you hear uh, me? Yeah, okay. One, good. Just I'm one good. minute, and then and then Frank Bajner will have his close closing. You got Just it. One minute. Go. You got it. Go. Jonathan Erickson was cut, but you know what? He's in Grand Rapids now. No problem there. Um, he's. Uh, but for a last overall draft pick, you know, he was a serviceable defenseman. Good pick, Kenny. Quandre Diggs traded to the uh, Seattle Seahawks along with the seventh rounder for the fifth round pick. Not a bad deal. Uh, certainly it hurts to lose a captain, but um, Kayvon Wilson, Will Harris are playing well in his stead. And last of all, if you're looking to uh, tank for the wings and you want to see some prospects, the potential number one pick in the draft, Quinton Byfield will be in Saginaw, Michigan on Saturday night to, with the Sudbury Wolves to take on Cole Perfetti. Bodie Wild and the Saginaw Spirit. Taylor, back to you. All right. Thanks, Todd. Um, Got it. Good follow stuff, him Todd. On, thanks, buddy. Follow Todd Faber at, on Twitter at Shut Up Faber. Frank, closing statement, go. You got one minute. Well, I will say this, and I'm going to do it with the Red Wings. If things do continue to slide, then they keep giving up five goals. Don't be surprised if Steve Eisman does something to shake the tree. What it is, it's hard for me to say, but I'd say just stay tuned on that one. And all Michigan fans, don't degrade players for making a mistake on the field. Otherwise, you know, you're going to get arrested. Yeah. And if, if anything, if you want to tell them something, tell them, hey, shake it off, play the next play. You got it. There's a lot of football left to be played. And I'll just leave it at that. And, I, and truthfully, I hope that when – Ronnie Bell catches his first pass against Notre Dame at that whole stadium. Cheers louder than ever for him. All right. Less than a minute left. Let's go ahead and wrap this up. For Frank, I'm Taylor. Follow the show on Twitter, on Paris, Twitter, Periscope, and Instagram at Michigan underscore truth. Like its Facebook page, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast, and check out its website, the Michigan Sports Truth Podcast.com. Prime time with the Stables Network.com, the Stables Network on YouTube. TTFN, Tata for now. Bon appetit. Him with a high.